Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. We're really excited because we have one of our favorites here from YPTC, although I think I say that, Ellie, a lot when we have YPTC guests on. But really and truly, you've been with us from the get-go, and it's really been fun to get to know you and to learn with you. And today we have you for two days back-to-back. That's a heavy lift, my friend. It's a heavy lift, but I think this is a neat topic and it's easy to kind of spread it over two days. And and I think the two days will be intertwined a little bit, but you know, I love this stuff and I was so excited when you invited me. So thank you so much. Well, you know, this is one of those things that I think a lot of times we, we don't engage our um, boards with the accounting functions like we should. We kind of expect everything to be ready to go and wrapped up with a bow, but we don't always know how it gets there. And so you're going to be talking to us about the 10, I'd say top 10 issues that nonprofit boards must monitor. And I'm going to man up and say, you didn't like that I chose the word monitor. Why is that? Well, so what I really wanted to kind of take this in the direction of um, things board members shouldn't assume or should it take for granted in their roles as board members? And I think it's very common for organizations to um, kind of do a one and done training type thing with board members and you know, not realize that when they're not asking questions or not participating in meetings as much as you want them to, that they, instead of thinking they must know what they're talking, they, they must know everything, right? You have to assume they really don't no, and they're afraid to ask questions. I, so, yeah, I love it. Right. And I think you're right. I think you're right about that in many areas, not just accounting. I think mm-hmm. that, you know, we're dealing with high functioning, g- generally kind of forceful characters. And they, they're not comfortable saying, I don't know. I don't know the answer. It's an I ego think- Absolutely. They're not comfortable saying, I don't know, but they also um, don't know what they're supposed to know, right? Right. Like they they don't know what they don't know. And they really join, you know, board members come on onto a board because they love what the organization does. They want to be associated with the mission of the organization. And I think you and I have talked about this many times they don't realize the gravity of the responsibilities that they have in that role and that it's a partnership with the organization that they get the training and support that they need to know what those responsibilities are and that it's a constant conversation that needs to be happening. And so that's really where I want to take our points the next two days is really don't forget that you should know these things, but that you shouldn't take them for granted either. I love it. Well, one of the things that we're not taking for granted is our amazing new co-host panel. We have folks coming to us from all over the country with a lot of different ideas, different practices, and we're really, really excited to be, have been rolling these folks out. And I, I hope that um, our viewers and listeners have been able to, to meet them. We also want to make sure that we shout out uh, a point of gratitude to our amazing presenting sponsors. And Ellie, I say this a lot, but you know, it's fascinating to me. We've done now more than a thousand shows. We're in our fifth year of broadcasting. Most of these folks have been with us since the very beginning. Um, Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, where, where Ellie Hume joins us from, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. You know, as we rolled in, uh, we introduced Ellie Hume, Eleanor, the official name, but we call her uh, Ellie, now Regional Director with Your Part-Time Controller, Ellie, I know you're based in New York, but really quickly before we get into this drill down, talk to us about what your direct work is and how you work within this amazing network of of people and professionals. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as well as many of of your listeners know, we have grown substantially. Your part-time controller is such a growing organization, and we are all about supporting our team members 
And it became a lot for our um, chief uh, client service officer to kind of oversee all of our teams across the country, as well as uh, be responsible for opening new offices as we continue to grow. So we um, added uh, the regional director position. There are four of us okay. and we are supporting existing teams as well as well as I have substantial responsibility to open these new markets. So my, uh, I support, I still support our New York team, which I'm so proud of um, what's happened there and, and being able to hand that off to my colleague, Rachel. I also support our New England team. So you've met Hatsy Cutshaw. Yes. She, she uh, continues to lead our New England team. And uh, as I mentioned earlier to you in, our, in the kind of green room area, we just opened an office in Denver, and that has been um, part of part of my role to really do the research and um, identify the leader and get them going. So we just launched that in April. We're very excited. You know, Denver has a really robust nonprofit um, sector because they re they're regional, right? You know, they're kind of like my community is that they're not just dealing with that that group you know geographically they go into the rocky mountain west or as they say the rocky mountain states and so what a great great market and a really a vast uh amount of work that that those nonprofits do in that part of the country because they deal with tribal nations they deal with rural uh america yeah it's it what a great thing good job thank good you job. I'm very excited okay. well we got to get back to the, the mission at hand. And I say the mission at hand because one of the very first things that you want us to be aware of, and this is like, I hate to say it, it's kind of like a duh, but then I was like, yeah, this is where we should start. And you say the mission statement. This shocked wow. me a little bit because it makes me think that you are seeing board members who don't really know what the mission is. Is that true? That's exactly what I'm talking about here. When mm -hmm. I put this on the list, it's, you know, it's not a one and done, you know, organizations, as I said, um, they bring in board members because people like the mission, but do they really know what the mission statement is? And would they be able to create their own elevator pitch to talk to someone about the organization? So um, I think we take that for granted that all of our board members could easily describe and state our mission statement um, if asked and to be a representative of the organization, you got to have your elevator pitch, right? Yeah. So I think um, one of the things I wanted to say here is I really hope that organizations will consider talking about the mission statement at the beginning of every board meeting, like say the Say the mission statement. And I think one really cool way to help people really ingrain the mission statement um, across the board is to have somebody different share what their connection is to the mission statement at each meeting and the stories that are happening and how they're sharing mi the mission with others um, will just continue to, to grow the impact and the understanding. Yeah, I love that. And I think that is really, really, um, you know, important. And I think that it is, it can become a part of your culture and it can become a part of your natural just cadence and speak, right? And your speech or speak, however you want to use that word, is that how we just navigate this. We start, we keep rolling this in, we keep pulling this out and ensuring that. Um, love this way to start our day, but I want to back up a little bit because we have a really interesting question that came in and you are the perfect person to answer this. And um, I really appreciate this, this viewer writing this. She writes, please pardon my ignorance. Could you explain the purpose of a controller? Thank you. All so, right. Yeah. I, you know what? Good, de good deal. I love, you know, we started off by saying people are afraid to ask what they don't know or ask questions. Absolutely. So I'll start out by saying the controller role is, is referred to in many different terms, director of finance, controller, accounting manager, CFO. It can be under a lot of different terminology, but um, it's an accounting term uh, we're in the finance department, 
and um, often are kind of the head of accounting at, at, at smaller organizations. Sometimes you have a CFO. Um, at YPTC, we act in a lot of different capacities, but the controller is the person who really has overall um, responsibility for understanding and closing the, the books and records, uh, the financial books and records of the organization, making sure that they're properly reconciled, that financial statements are issued in a timely manner, and that they're analyzed properly. And so that's the purpose of a controller. We're, we're accounting and financial experts. Love it. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to our viewer that asked that question, because you're right. Um, this is that whole, you, you started off using the word assume. It's a perfect example of it. Um, so thank you. That's, that's really cool. I, I love having that uh, show up on the nonprofit show. Monitor number two, point number two, assumption number two, the role of governance. And yeah. I can't wait to hear what you have to think about that because I feel that we don't talk about this until there's a problem. Right. And that kind of goes back to um, other conversations you and I have had over the years that um, I've been on the show with you is there's a lot of roles and responsibilities that board members have in terms of oversight of the organization. And that is really the governance, right? It's making sure the organization is following all the rules you know, meeting their mission as they said they would, that they have all the right resources in place. And it's just a big oversight term, right? It's it's the, the oversight of the organization. But I think um, what I really wanna say here in terms of the assumptions is we assume that once we tell a board member what their responsibilities are, their roles and responsibilities are in governance, they just will remember them. <laughs> And we don't have to repeat them and we don't we have to explain them. Yeah. So, you know, I think we've come a long way in having organizations be more thoughtful about orientation for board members and explaining what their governance roles and responsibilities are. But we then say, well, we already did that last year. We don't have to do that again. Or we only offer orientation to new board members. We do, it's not a constant thing that we require all board members to keep going through orientation so that we don't forget what our responsibilities are. And I also wanted to say here is, um, you know, we we often think about board participation as this like nice thing that we are doing for the community and we're putting it on our on our resume and it looks good but it's actually a job that we have to take seriously. And I think that's the other piece of, we can't assume that every board member is gonna take it as seriously as the next. Yeah. And we have to keep reiterating um, the governance piece of what we do and how it plays into their um, ongoing role with the organization. Yeah, I love that you brought that up because I think you're right. I think it is not a one and done. Um, you know, these are busy people, they're volunteers, they might be with you once a month, once a month, right? And then or once a quarter, or once a quarter, and then you're like, you know, thinking that just because you're in the mix of it, you they're they're treading water the same as you, and that is not the case. And so I love that you you brought this up um because I think a lot of times it's the chink in the armor. Um, okay, now we got to get back to, we got to drill down with like item number three, and that's the nonprofit's financial statements. Talk yes. to us about this, because it seems to me this is one of those areas of tremendous fear within the board, because they don't know how to do it. Absolutely. And I think that where organizations go wrong is they assume board members know how to read the financial statements because they didn't ask any questions, right? The finance director, or controller, or CFO, whoever's presenting, maybe it's the treasurer, puts these financial statements in front of the board and they say a handful of things. Oh, cash is this, and this is what happened this time. And they say, say a really, it sounds good, so it must be right. <laughs> so nobody asks any questions. Um, and they make assumptions that 
that people who are preparing them are actually skilled in doing so, that, um, you know, that they're closing the books properly and actually reconciling the accounts on a regular basis before financial statements are actually prepared so that there's some integrity of um, complete and ac completeness and accuracy behind them. And I think that's where we can get a little bit better as board members in um, not being afraid to say, hey, you know what? I need an explanation here. I'm not a finance person. Can you not talk in debits and credits? Can you give me some visualization so I can better understand what you're trying to say here? And again, not just assuming because no one is asking questions that they know and understand what you're what you're presenting. Mm -hmm. You know, Ellie, I think this might be an interesting time to also mention that in the nonprofit world, we actually use a little bit of different vocabulary for the same thing. So if you're working with a board that most often, I'd say 99% they're gonna of the time, they're gonna come from the for-profit sector, and then they might be seeing some phraseology or some terms, and they don't really know what that means. And again, as we started off there, they're intimidated to raise their hand and say, I don't know what that means. Exactly. And I think it's it's the organization's responsibility as well as the board's responsibility to partner and figure out how do we make sure that everybody um, is on the same page about. And uh, I was just reviewing one of my presentations is coming up um, for the AICPA, the um, American Institute of CPAs, and it's about educating the board. We have to assess where our board members are and then bring them the education um, and also as finance professionals present the information in an easy to understand way. And I think that's where we as accountants sometimes get stuck in our ways of, well, we understand it. Everybody should know what I'm talking about. And so we do need to stop and define things and explain the differences. Um, and as you said, nonprofit organizations, they have different terms like net assets <laughs> and net assets with restrictions. What does that mean? You know, so it's our job as finance professionals to work with um, each of the nonprofit organizations that we're either employed by or serve as from a consulting perspective to help explain and constantly be providing the education our board members need in order to use and understand the or finances to make decisions for the organization. I'm going to throw in a quick question before we move on to our, our yes. next two items. And that is so many organizations are moving to a consent agenda format whereby they um, upload to a portal or sometimes just generally send it off via email to their board members to get through a lot of reports and, and, and committee reports and, you know, all of this. Do you find that that's a good idea or a bad idea or what are your thoughts on that? Because um, are in our board members even looking at these reports if they are requested to do so before a meeting and show up and be prepared? What do you what are your thoughts on that? I have so many mixed feelings about that, okay? And I say feelings because like it makes me uncomfortable to think about nonprofits posting financials somewhere or sending them an email and okay saying, if you have nothing to say, then you must agree with these things. Or you hit a button and say, okay, I read them. Well, again, we've made a lot of assumptions that those people who received them know what they're looking at and know how to read them. Financial statements are, it's often, um, it's a lot of numbers. And as you said, terminology that doesn't necessarily make sense to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and each organization presents their data a different way. They call accounts different things. The statements have different names than you're used to in the for-profit world. And um, unless you have done the legwork to really provide the education and assess the skills and abilities of, your, of all of your board members to digest that information, I would not um, think that a consent agenda is a good idea. Okay, hair and fire moment. I did not think you were going to say that. So I'm, I, well, because I hadn't thought of some of those aspects. I hadn't thought of it. Is it, 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 
makes it actually in some ways easier just to say, yeah, I saw it versus sitting in a room where everybody's quiet. You know, it's very interesting. Very you have interesting. to take the pulse and, you know, what do people take out of the financial information? What is it telling the board about the conversations that need to happen and the decisions that they need to participate in? And unless it's an open discussion, you have no idea what they're thinking right. or not thinking, right? Okay. Most, I can tell you, we know this, board members are busy people. Mm -hmm. If you tell them to read something ahead of time, there's a 50-50 chance they're not going to do it. Yeah. You know, I'm on a board and, you know, I had to, I had to schedule time in advance for myself as a reminder that I must go and review the information. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right. It's a, it's a scheduled activity because I know how busy my work life and my personal life are that if I'm going to take this job seriously as a board member, I have to know that I have to be prepared for the conversations that are going to happen at the board meeting. And that's on me to do that. Right. I, I love that. I love this part of the, our discussion, but the reality is we got to get through two more issues. <laughs> number four, you advise us is to monitor philanthropy and fundraising. What does that look like to you? So we uh, sometimes I think take for granted that the executive director or the director of development or fundraising are the only ones responsible for bringing money into the organization, <laughs> that that's their job. They got this. I don't have to worry about it, but that's not true, mm -hmm. right? Part of the board's responsibility is to ensure the organization has enough resources. And that means either personally contributing in some way, shape or form, right? You, we know a lot of organizations have very defined kind of a give get policy, right? You either give this amount of money or you help solicit it and bring it in. Um, or they have, um, I like the board that I'm on has a give what you feel comfortable with, mm -hmm. right? What's mm -hmm. right for you? Because there are a lot of boards that need people that represent the communities that they serve that cannot give $1,000, $5,000, $10,000. I mean, some of these give gets on for board members are excessive. And but yeah. once you get all those board members that can bring in those resources, often they have zero connection to the actual community that they represent. Yeah. Right. So um, we can't forget that it is the board members. Part of their job is to help direct like, oh, I heard this funding opportunity came up. Have Has my organization, do they know about it? Have they applied? We have to be bringing that. It can't just be, you know, thought of as the responsibility of the executive director or the development director to, to be the only fundraisers for the organization. I love, I love that the way you phrased it too, because it is, um, we all need to be rowing in that direction. And yeah. And, and I think what you said is magical. There are points of connectivity that we don't, sometimes to us, they're just like so basic. And then, you know, it's like, well, wait a minute, we could do that. Or, you know, um, that I think is something that is a missing link for so many organizations, you know, and it should be one of the most simple things. Okay. Absolutely. Number, number five, I want to spend a little bit more time on because this is a big one. And I think a lot of times, this is like a shocker when it gets in um, a board member is asked to ex uh, execute this or you take a vote and this is exercise. The COI conflict of interest policy. One of the few questions that you are asked about on the 1099, right? Does your nonprofit have a COI policy? Talk to us about this. Sure. So what is this? It is a mechanism that board members are required to disclose any conflicts of interest that may um, be between them or outside businesses that they're related to and the nonprofit that they're serving on. Okay, so you have to disclose that information at least annually. Okay. And I say at least because conflicts can arise at any time. Okay, and we forget to be thinking about that throughout the year, 
Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and I think something to think about as a board member, you know, let's say the executive director came to the board meeting and there was a great conversation about bringing in a nonprofit accounting consultant. And somebody on the board says, oh, my sister does that. We could just use them. So now what happens? Well, <laughs> okay, that person might be properly skilled and you know have a business. Let's let's just say it's YPTC, mm -hmm. right? Well, now there's a conflict of interest because the board member is related to right. someone at YPTC. So that's a conflict of interest. We don't want to wait until the end of the year to disclose that. We just disclosed it right there in the board meeting <laughs> because somebody said, oh, my sister is an accountant. Um, but we have to document that. And it has to be part of a vetting process. You don't just say, oh, well, OK, well, we'll work with them because you know them. Right. There still has to be a proper vetting um, process. And the person who nominated them, who has that conflict, has to recuse themselves from the decision to whether to hire that person or organization. So I think those are the things that we take for granted. We want our board members to constantly come up with ideas to help us find people to help in different areas, right? Whether it's hiring you for something or hiring YPTC for something, whatever it is, a legal counsel. I mean, you might know your, lawyer, your brother's a lawyer. <laughs> Right. Um, you got to disclose those things and we have to be thinking about it in real time. Um, you know, and if you find out at a board meeting, oh, we hired uh, YPTC and you personally realize, uh oh, I'm related to someone that works there. Right. You have to stop and disclose it right then. Right. And, and I think that, that's what we forget. Right. And I think that recusal, rec recusal part is really important as you step back. And that is tricky because if you're a small group or you don't have, you know, but just a, a skosh over the quorum and you recuse yourself, sometimes that can default the vote, right? That, no. that you can't take an action. So yeah, you're right. This is something we need to be super thoughtful of. Well, you have been always super thoughtful with us, my friend, Ellie Hume. Um, I just want to really quickly recap what we talked about in, in drill down day one, because we have a second day of this. And in the, the next day, it, it's completely different. I mean, so many different things, but you said this in the beginning, and I think you're right, they, they kind of weave together. And so we talked about starting with the mission statement and how our board members don't always know what the mission statement really is, nor can they articulate it. Governance, what does that mean? And why is this a responsibility and a legal liability for our board members? Financial statements, really interesting conversation about how we review them, how we live with them. Um, and this is a heavy lift. And this is a conversation that goes on and on. And then the, the philanthropy and fundraising part. Um, this is not just a job that they're doing over there in that cubicle. <laughs> this is all of us. And we need to have more of a culture of that. And then the COI, the conflict of interest, such an important issue for all of us to recognize. Ellie Hume, you are just a treasure. I always love what you have to say. I love your thought leadership. I think you, like a lot of your uh, the folks that you work with, um, I feel like I could tell you anything and you wouldn't be like, oh my God, you're an idiot. Or, you know, <laughs> you're, you're very, um, you like to educate people. You're very open. You're not an alarmist. Um, and so I just think you break down a lot of those fear barriers. And so it's just always a delight to have you on the show. Again, Eleanor Ellie Hume, regional director now at your part-time controller. You might see her in the air sometime soon because she's traveling all over this country, um, helping right. her team and, and really helping grow YPTC. You can check out YPTC.com and learn more about what they do and how they do it. There are a lot of free resources that YPTC offers. You do not have to be one of their clients, but you can get valuable information. And so I can't recommend that enough. Another thing that's amazing here is we have these great sponsors and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, 
nonprofit thought leader, staffing boutique, your part-time controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. So my friend, you will be back here tomorrow with another five points that we need to really be thinking and talking about when we are thinking about our boards. It'll be really yes. interesting. I can't wait to see you tomorrow. It'll be a lot of fun. Hey, everybody, as we end each and every episode of The Nonprofit Show, we want to leave you with this message. And that is to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here.